one of the ideas that uh, both Jim Scott and the the other owners came up with was they they realized that the ASL kind of it, it needed a face um, and it needed someone who could give them a little bit more legitimacy. Um, so they decided, okay, we're going to go out, we're going to get you know someone related to professional sports who's a household name. Um, and actually, the first person they tried to get was uh, broadcaster Howard Cassell, and uh, and he turned them down. Um, but Jim Scott came up with the idea of let's contact Bob Cousy. And Jim had grown up on the East Coast and uh, where Cousy was known as the Houdini of the hardwood, this incredible NBA player, um, really well-liked, really great career. And as Jim Scott referred to him, he said to me, you know, growing up as a kid where I come from, Bob Cousy was God. Everybody knew him. Um, interestingly enough, though, Bob Cousy was not well-liked in Cincinnati. Uh, he had been brought in to coach the NBA Cincinnati Royals. Um, he briefly came out of retirement to play as a player. Um, he traded Oscar Robertson, which was incredibly unpopular. The team went on a downward trend, and he helped negotiate the move uh, to Kansas City. So he was not really well liked by the local media here, but even Jim Scott realized this is a name who can kind of get us in the headlines and really show that we're, we're committed to, to rising up and really elevating this league to something more professional. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey, everybody. How are you? My name's Tim Hanlon, and uh, you have again stumbled across our little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. We call it Good Seats Still Available, and I can't thank you enough for being part of it for our little journey together and uh, this particular episode, which is devoted to uh, a league in professional soccer that is often forgotten uh, called the American Soccer League. Yes, the league that uh, in the 1970s, at least, and the early 1980s operated very much in the shadow of the far bigger and whiter, hotter Comet, no pun, although maybe pun, uh, of the North American Soccer League. Uh, the ASL for you soccer historians out there, of course, uh, existed for many, many decades before the 70s, I think dating back to the 20s, perhaps. Uh, I need to go back and check my Steve Hollyrod uh, uh, soccer archives for the actual start date, so I'm sure Steve will correct me. But uh, the uh, 1970s with the arrival or the reconstitution, I guess, of the NASL, uh, the arrival of Pelé and foreign players and many more franchises and national television, uh, this ASL that had been around for many, many years, largely, uh, I would say, on the fringes of life, uh, mostly as uh, that of an ethnic oriented league, uh, mostly uh, community based, northeast based, perhaps a bit of the central uh, United States based. Um, really uh, started to kind of get its professional act together, or at least attempted to, uh, in the early to mid-1970s. Uh, as the NASL was gaining steam, uh, the ASL was uh, converting franchises from uh, these somewhat ragtag and semi-professional-alike uh, uh, ethnic clubs into things that were a bit more Americanized and uh, professional-looking and sounding. Um, and you know, I'm sure we're going to spend a few more episodes in the in the months to come on the ASL. But this this particular story that we're focused on today uh, is a pretty good microcosm. It is a story of the uh, Cincinnati Comets, uh, the team that in 1972 uh, was a uh, an expansion franchise in the uh, American Soccer League and and won the uh, the championship in its first season. Um, it's a fascinating little story, uh, and it's full of intrigue, frankly, because uh, a lot of what uh, has uh, be become a hugely successful franchise uh, today with FC Cincinnati, uh, certainly owes a bit of its history uh, to this uh, interesting little club that played in the ASL, the Cincinnati Comets, that, uh, as we'll find out in a few minutes with our guest, Randy Salerno, uh, almost became a franchise itself in the NASL around 1976. We're going to get way into that story. I learned a bunch of things that I thought I knew, but I didn't, uh, and I think you will too. Uh, in a couple of seconds with our guest, uh, live and exclusive from Cincinnati, Ohio, Ronnie Salerno, uh, talking about the Cincinnati Comets in uh, just a couple of seconds. Um, I want to thank uh, our friends at Audible again for sponsoring our fine little broadcast. And again, uh, we want to remind you that uh, at audibletrial.com slash goodseats, uh, that is the place to go to give a, a trial to the Audible audiobook service. 
uh, your taste of the service for uh, you to enjoy a free audiobook download from their extensive catalog of over 180,000 titles uh, in just about every genre imaginable uh, for you to listen to. Get your free one month trial uh, of the Audible service and a free audiobook download for you to, to enjoy at audibletrial.com slash good seats. Again, audibletrial.com slash good seats. Uh, you can cancel at any time. A free audiobook is a great way to give it a try. And uh, I love audiobooks, and uh, Audible is uh, the king of the services out there for, for such. And I encourage you to give it a try. Again, audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free first month of the Audible service and a free audiobook download. Give it a try, will you? Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, let's uh, not waste any more time. Let us get to this very interesting story about the history of the American Soccer League's Cincinnati Comets with our guest, Ronnie Salerno, here on the podcast. This is a very interesting story to me. I, um, you know, as I've started this show uh, a couple of months back, you know, focused on um, uh, teams and leagues that don't exist anymore. And, and you've been kind with... Uh, uh, a couple of uh, of commentaries on uh, online and, and Twitter and stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I, at least a few people are listening, which is great. Um, but ironically, uh, you had reached out to me, uh, I guess, to con uh, compliment me on a show or something. And um, I had actually put your uh, email and a uh, an article that you wrote, which we're going to talk about here today, uh, in my uh, little file of to uh, come back to. Uh, ironically, as I went down the rabbit hole of the story of the Cincinnati Comets, the uh, American Soccer League team, ASL, uh, back in the 1970s, that um, as you as you look into the story, a very interesting story that that is really a, a story not only about Cincinnati and professional soccer before we know it today, uh, but also of the league uh, itself, the ASL, as it struggled in the shadows uh, of the more popular and well-known North American soccer league. So um, all of that is uh, as prelude. Maybe you could give our audience a bit of a head start here. Um, what inspired you to go further into this uh, very interesting and, and kind of not really known story about the Cincinnati Comets of the old ASL? Uh, well, so I've always had like an, an affinity or an interest in Cincinnati history. Um, I, I'm from here. I've lived here my whole life. Um, always followed the sports teams pretty closely, uh, always had an interest in our minor league teams. Um, and I used to not really care for soccer. Um, and then as I got into it over the years, I was really interested in following MLS expansion. And then, uh, you know, eventually we got our club here in the USL, um, which has been extraordinary to follow. And it just kind of got me thinking about some of these other teams and the story of the NASL, the original NASL was always really fascinating to me. And I had seen that documentary, um, The Extraordinary Story of the, the New York Cosmos, um, and it just kind of got me thinking, you know, what about Cincinnati soccer history? And I grew up watching some of the indoor teams as a kid. Um, and just looking at the teams online, there was a small Wikipedia article for the Cincinnati Comets. And I just happened to be sitting around one day and I was like, oh, I'm going to look it up on a newspaper archive website and see if there's anything about them. And there was this, uh, this advertisement um, in an old Cincinnati Enquirer, um, and it advertised the Comets uh, versus England, international friendly at Nippert Stadium. Um, and I couldn't believe that this team, A, was playing at international friendly, and B, had played at Nippert Stadium, um, which is where FC Cincinnati currently plays and who had just hosted their own international friendly. Um, and that, like, that just kind of got it started. And I kept looking at more articles and looking at more and then had to make a timeline of it. And there were so many details to it and so many little interesting things going on. It just kind of, it got me hooked. And I found the story to be very, very interesting. I, I think for our audience, it's important to, uh, to uh, uh, reference the fact that um, uh, FC Cincinnati is uh, perhaps arguably uh, the most uh, successful, certainly attendance uh, wise uh, franchises in the fledgling, uh, USL Division Three, perhaps Division Two next year league. Uh, you want to maybe give a bit of an insight as to uh, the phenomenon that has become the FC Cincinnati story for those who are not familiar with it. Yeah, so um, in summer of 2015, kind of towards the end of the summer, a rumor starts going around that FC Cincinnati is going to be this club in uh, the United Soccer League um, who 
earlier that year had launched a team in Louisville that was having a lot of success. Uh, they had a lot of success in Sacramento. Um, and people were pretty skeptical about a team playing here. And uh, one day they held a press conference at Nippert Stadium, which had just been renovated. It's uh, the University of Cincinnati's football stadium. Um, they had all these very kind of uh, lofty ambitions, as a, another local author described it. Uh, they immediately said their their goal was to pursue Major League Soccer, uh, despite Columbus being right up the road and several other teams having interest. And they wanted 10,000 season ticket holders. And uh, there's quite a few people who were interested. The original marketing and messaging was kind of eh. It was kind of strange. Uh, so I think a lot of us were still skeptical. But there was a ton of people who really wanted to see pro soccer um, you know, pro domestic soccer happen here. And a lot of people jumped on board. Uh, me and some friends started one of the, uh, many supporters groups that have cropped up. Um, and we get to that first match and things kind of progress since the first home match and 14,000 people show up and everyone's just kind of blown away. There's 14,000 people here for a division three professional soccer match. And it just kept snowballing from there. Soon we had crowds of 20,000, 23,000, uh, the team was playing really well on the pitch. Uh, the players were out in the community making connections with people. You could tell they truly cared about being here and playing, and it just it just clicked. Uh, they played Crystal Palace in an international friendly in their first year. They got to host a playoff game, and it just seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And all the while that's happening, there's this whole Major League Soccer pursuit kind of happening in the background and simultaneously. Um, so we went from a city that had no professional soccer for quite some time, had a few amateur teams to all of a sudden a major contender for major league soccer and setting attendance records throughout the country. So as that has grown and obviously, uh, Cincinnati is very much in the, uh, in the thick of things for, uh, MLS, uh, expansion. And it's also very interesting too, considering how close Columbus is, uh, an MLS market. And, uh, I think frankly took, uh, MLS, uh, builders by surprise as well. So to your credit, a uh, pretty amazing story in such a short period of time for that franchise. Yeah, absolutely. It's been, it's, it's been very, very cool to see it unfold. I think, especially knowing the history of the Comets and some of the other teams and just minor league teams here in general, uh, I thought it would be popular. I thought it would take off. You know, the joke is everybody's always been saying since the eighties, soccer has finally made it here in the States. And I think a lot of us were a little skeptical, like, is this really going to catch or are we going to have another minor league team come in and flame out? And I mean, it's just been incredible from the start. They, they've done a really good job. Uh, the supporters and fans have done a good job. And it's it's really come to represent the city and kind of the resurgence we're having here. Well, it, that, that makes the story of the old Cincinnati Comets that much more interesting, right? Because, you know, I'm, as I'm sure we'll get to the as we get to the story for uh, in a minute, um, not necessarily a... Um, a huge soccer history and culture in the in the city of Cincinnati, or at least obvious. Uh, but maybe you want to sort of take us back to the beginnings of this curious story of the Comets, which, frankly, the, this, the more I read it, the more uh, layers it seems to have. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's um, it, it's very interesting because professional soccer here has never really, whether it was indoor or outdoor, never really captured the attention of the press or fans or just casual people looking for a night out, like looking for entertainment. Um, a couple of the indoor teams never really, never really caught on. Uh, there's a lot of history of amateur teams that seem to have like little local, local followings. Um, but when the Comets came along, uh, it was almost like a typical Cincinnati thing. You know, New York and Chicago are building subways. Well, we built one, but then we abandoned it. Um, everyone else is building airports. We built one in another state, and we've got all kinds of problems with that. <laughs> Everybody else is getting professional soccer. They're joining the original NASL. Uh, we're going to get a team in this offshoot kind of more minor league ASL. Um, so right from the get-go, despite their best efforts and best intentions, the league they were in was kind of kind of fly by night and didn't really have the best reputation. So they're kind of fighting an uphill battle. You've got a sport that's pretty obscure at the time. Um, and not really all that popular, um, playing in a very minor league stadium with a minor league budget run by this eclectic personality who loves the game, um, but really didn't seem to have an interest in teaching that to people. He, I think he just assumed people would show up like they were kind of doing in other cities. So as much as they tried and for all the ups and downs they had, no one here really seemed to seem to care 
all that much as best as I can tell. I wasn't, I wasn't around back then, um, which just makes it even more interesting that all of a sudden FC Cincinnati is the talk of the town in American soccer now, whereas in the past, the, the Comets were certainly not the Cosmos of New York. Well, so maybe you can get into uh, uh, the beginnings of uh, of the team, and, and I guess maybe a, also a bit of a background. How did you kind of do your digging? You said newspaper archives, but uh, what were the main sources for you to uh, – and by the way, we should reference that this article uh, that Ronnie wrote um, uh, is called The Extraordinary Story of the Cincinnati Comets. Uh, it can be found on um, – his website that's Queen City Disco, uh, sorry, Queen City Disco dot com, correct? Yeah, Queen City Disco or Queen City Discovery dot com. Either one works. Very good, and that, uh, but it was originally uh, seen in uh, a local publication in Cincinnati as well, correct? Uh, the story of the comets or yeah. my website? Your your uh, the the uh, story. Correct. Yeah. So where I kind of came across it was that original advertisement we were talking about and. Uh, my, mainly my sources were through digging through newspaper archives. So uh, the Cincinnati Enquirer, um, the Hamilton Journal News covered it a little bit. That's a city just north of here. And uh, Cincinnati Magazine had several articles about about it over the years. So it was mainly those those three. And occasionally when I needed news about the league or try to find something about the league, I'd find something in the Chicago Sun-Times or even the New York Times might have a small mention of it. Um, but it was mainly a lot of digging through newspapers.com, which has a ton of a ton of different papers archived, which I, for other articles I write unrelated to soccer had always been a good resource. So I, I just kept digging through that um, and then just kind of found the, the starting point for the Comets with Dr. Nick Caporo and then just went through there and went year by year by year. So April 1972, uh, you mentioned uh, a certain Dr. Caporo, Dr. Nico, nicknamed Nick Caporo. A lifelong fan and coach of uh, of soccer, um, uh, essentially uh, stumbles across the idea, along with uh, the team in Cleveland, to uh, be awarded a franchise in the uh, longest uh, lasting soccer league in the country, the American Soccer League or ASL, which circa 1972 um, uh, was really kind of beginning to sort of shed its uh, long-standing, very ethnically oriented uh, background as a league of uh, regional teams and and players, and frankly, not very American players at that. Uh, as the North American Soccer League, the bigger, sort of newer sister, uh, was starting to gain some uh, some credibility and and widespread attention. Yeah. Um, so, Dr. Nick Caporo, um, he's an Italian immigrant from Naples. He, um, he's living in Cincinnati. Uh, he's got a little bit of money and he, he loves the game. He had coached a, a few amateur sides here in town. Um, by all accounts, seemed to have a little bit of money given his private practice. He's also the uh, Claremont County coroner, um, just to the, to the east of the city. You're kidding. He's a, hey. he's a coroner as well. Yeah. He was the coroner, um, before he owned the Comets through when he owned the Comets all the way up until I want to say about 2002. Um, and then he, re- he maintained a private practice and got into some other stuff after that. But yeah, he was the coroner the whole time of <laughs> Claremont a- County, which is ju- just east of Cincinnati. Unbelievable. Yeah. So he, he had a very, he had a lot of things going on. Like whenever I think about all the things on my plate, I'm trying to juggle. This guy had his own private practice. He's the coroner of an entire county. And he's also coaching and owning a professional soccer team. But uh, yeah, he helped start the ASL's Midwest division which included uh, new teams in Chicago, a new team in Cleveland, a new team in Cincinnati. And I, I think St. Louis was also in the Midwest division at the time um, and didn't opt for the North American Soccer League. I don't know if they necessarily had the money for that. Uh, I've never found like a good indication, uh, but he seemed content with it. And his goal, he stated from the beginning was, you know, there's no American talent. He's like, you know, give us a few years. And his goal, his stated goal was to turn the Midwest division of the ASL into like a farm league for the men's national team and to hopefully bring that back up to prominence. Well, that that actually seems to, and, and soccer historians are probably salivating uh, as you sort of say these words, uh, with uh, where the ASL was kind of headed circa 72, 73, where uh, it was uh, a league that was, uh, like I said earlier, you know, entirely or predominantly an ethnic kind of circuit. And it seemed like the league itself, the people who were involved in the league and running it at the time, uh, were sort of uh, 
tipping their heads towards the idea of becoming more Americanized. Uh, and in particular, as a contrast to the NASL, uh, which seem to uh, still be very reliant on international talent. Yeah, that that definitely seemed to be like their niche and the, their goal right from the beginning. And I, I think there was a little bit of marketing behind that, some marketing thought put into that of, you know, if we really want to sell this to an American audience, I, I think they believe they needed to see that those fans needed to see American players out there. Because um, at the time, you know, it's definitely not seen as an American sport. And uh, that seemed to really be where they were going from or heading towards, like, you know, developing domestic talent, hopefully getting the men's national team up to where they felt would be up to par. Um, Unfortunately, that's, you know, especially with the Comets, that's not where it heads. Um, They eventually had to do a lot of things that teams are still doing today where they're relying heavily on foreign talent just because the infrastructure and the talent available, the talent pool internationally is so much bigger. And uh, Capurro really talked about that a lot his first year, becoming this this great domestic league and developing domestic talent. And um, ironically, by the end of it, he he really kind of abandoned that whole thing. Well, not even by the end. It seems like in uh, in year number one, uh, he was uh, finding talent from uh, other uh, shores other than those in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, right right from the get go. Um, he, had, he had a few American players sprinkled in there, but he uh, he went so far as to have Ringo Cantillo, who um, I, I think I'm pronouncing that right, um, who became the star of the Comets. You know, he brings him up here and essentially make, lets him be a foreign exchange student. He lived with the coach um, and attended a high school out out where Nick Caporo lived. Um, and he kind of there's there's a quote in there where he kind of talks about that. How well, you know, eventually we want to develop American talent, but to get started right now, we need to win. And if we're going to make money, we got to win. If we're going to win, we're going to need some foreign talent. And over the years, it just became more and more heavily relied upon foreign talent. All right. Well, you do bring up uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, figure in all of this story, and that is um, uh, at the time a 16 year old uh, uh, import from Costa Rica named Julio Ringo Cantillo. Um, Somebody who was uh, a, an essential figure uh, throughout the uh, uh, the entirety of the um, Cincinnati Comets franchise, and actually, frankly, somebody uh, after this uh, episode, somebody that maybe would like to get on the uh, on the podcast at some point. Uh, he's uh, very much alive and uh, with us, and uh, would love to find out where he might be. So I'll put that out to our audience as to maybe where and uh, we could find uh, and get connected to Ringo Cantillo. But perhaps you can give a little bit more uh, background about. Uh, this uh, this phenom, frankly, who uh, who kind of lit up the league and uh, was arguably the most valuable player during the entirety of the uh, of the Comets franchise. Oh yeah, without a doubt. I mean, he he was the star and he was the guy the team was was built around. Uh, and I've never been able to quite track down exactly how Nick Caporo was able to find him. Um, but he seen Caporo seemed to have a pretty good pulse on kind of the international soccer scene, <clears throat> and he knew where to pull from knew where to recruit guys from because at the same time, he's not just competing with the ASL, but the NASL, which year by year is growing even more hungrier for, for more talent and expanding with teams. But he really hits a home run with Ringo Cantillo. Um, he has him come live with him as a foreign exchange student. Uh, he enrolls him in a local Catholic high school out where he lived. Um, there's a really good article about how, I mean, he's a 16 year old kid who is getting to come to the United States, which is a much different country than Costa Rica He's playing professional soccer. He's a paid professional athlete. And there's this great article, uh, I believe it's in the Enquirer, about how he's trying to adjust to his new life. And essentially he's, you know, he's a sophomore, junior in high school, and he's getting in trouble at a Catholic school for smoking cigarettes during class. And, you know, he's, he's, tra- he's having trouble completing all his assignments and doing all his homework because he's got to go to practice and go to games, uh, you know, at nights on the weekends. So it's really just kind of a lot of culture shock for this kid. Um, and to come from Costa Rica, where he's this big talent and everybody there loves the game, to Cincinnati, where he's got all these new opportunities, all these new experiences, and there's maybe 800 people showing up to each game. Yeah, we should talk about the attendance. But uh, before we, we get off of uh, Ringo's first year for a second, I mean, um, he was named the most valuable player of the league at that point, which was uh, 10, 12, 14 teams, right? So maybe he may have been, you know, you know, sneaking a cigarette here and there, you know, in the boys room <laughs> at the high school. But, you know, give the guy some credit because he was 
you know, he was the league's vi- most valuable player uh, at age 16, yeah. 17. It's, it's, it's an incredible, uh, hard to believe story. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's unbelievable. Even you, and People can say what they want about the ASL at the time and throughout its whole history, but I mean, to be the most valuable player in a professional soccer league, and like you said, 16 years old, is, is pretty awesome. And I mean, he wasn't just good. He played with a lot of good people. And uh, I mean, he took that initial, that first Comets franchise in their first year, and they won the league championship. You want to talk? You want to talk about the attendance, though. The uh, first season of the Comets was played at, uh, and I'm not uh, all that familiar with a little bit of uh, Cincinnati's geography, but Saint Xavier High School, which to me, as an outsider, seems like not necessarily the most professional of venues for soccer. No, uh, m- most definitely not. And e- even back then, it still probably wouldn't have really made the cut for even the NASL at the time. Um, and now, ironically, St. Xavier High School is this juggernaut of high school football um, in Ohio and throughout the Midwest. And the, the high school stadium they play at now is just gorgeous and beautiful. But back then, you know, it was like any other high school field, small stands, um, held enough people to got a big local following. But it really definitely was not known as a soccer venue and really didn't measure up to even some of the similar venues at the time. Um, so it was, it was very odd to see that they were playing there even back in the seventies. And they had a whole series of interesting venue choices throughout their life. But I always found it interesting that they started in a, in a high school football stadium in kind of the the West side suburbs. Well, look, if anybody, you know, follows uh, the history of of soccer in this country, especially in the uh, fledgling sixties and seventies, I mean, you know, high schools, uh, hell, even an MLS at Dallas, for example, uh, for a couple of years. And, um, you know, it's, it's just part of the, the dues paying and the, uh, and the process of growing the sport uh, here in this country. But it didn't seem to stop them, though, right? I mean, I think they only lost uh, one game in their uh, their eight season, excuse me, their eight game season. Uh, and that was uh, uh, an away game at, at Cleveland. So it seemed like it seemed like the, the home cooking actually did pretty well for them. Yeah, uh, I mean, there, there's a there's a great Cincinnati magazine expose on them. Uh, by a, a local author, named, a local journalist named Oscar Treadwell, who was actually a renowned jazz musician and reviewed jazz music, but was covering the comments in this one article. And he's got some photographs with it, and it shows some crowded stands, and they seem to be well attended, at least in that one match. But when you win all your games at home, I mean, what what better way to sell it to to the hometown crowd? I mean, and they're not drawing; they're they're winning. Um, so you really get to treat these new fans to something good. So. A lot like FC Cincinnati having uh, a great record their first year, the Comets, like, right out of the bat, were, were doing really, really well. Well, they won the championship against a team called the New York Greeks, which uh, is interesting to keep in mind going forward because uh, this would be a team that would be essentially their uh, their nemesis, no matter what they were called uh, in later years. But they yeah, won that, changed their names quite a few times. Yeah, and they won that championship in front of their home stadium. So clearly, you know, perhaps maybe even uh, uh, surpassing everybody's uh, – uh, you know, dreams at that point. 1972 was uh, not only the inaugural season of the Comets and the ASL, but a championship season at that. Um, you mentioned the crowds or the lack thereof. Um, maybe you can sort of segue us into 73 and maybe sort of where they kind of were uh, or not in the overall Cincinnati sports scene, right? Um, a little bit of a different sort of setting than, uh, than today's Cincinnati sports uh, franchise roster. Yeah, it was it was quite a bit different, um, and, and attendance numbers are really hard to come by for the Comets. Um, and I, I don't know if I really found anything concrete from that first year, but they seemed confident enough to move to a bigger venue. Um, they moved to the University of Cincinnati's Nippert Stadium, uh, which is the college football field, um, which is, even back then was it's a lot different than it is today, where FC Cincinnati plays. It's a beautiful modern venue, but even back then it was it was massive. It was pretty big and. For as much as they complained about the one loss the first year playing on AstroTurf, they moved to Nippert Stadium, which had just received AstroTurf. Um, but at the same time, they're facing a lot of a lot of competition. The uh, the Cincinnati Reds, um, the foundation of the Big Red Machine has just been laid. Um, the Cincinnati Royals were just getting ready to depart the NBA and move to Kansas City slash Omaha. Uh, but you also had the Cincinnati Swords which were a minor league hockey team that ended up being immensely popular. 
And then you have the Cincinnati Bengals who have just merged over from the AFL into the full-fledged NFL and were very, very popular. So there's a lot of sports entertainment dollars going around. You're in a fledgling league. You're in a fledgling sport. But they seem to feel confident enough to, to at least move to a bigger venue and hopefully draw a few more fans. Well, uh, you know, it seems like uh, Dr. Capurro and uh, and team um, did pretty darn well, right? Because the next season they went uh, undefeated, right? Uh, sorry, that's not true. They went 10 and 2 um, with uh, no ties, uh, which uh, was uh, along with their nemesis, the now renamed New York Apollo, uh, were really kind of the uh, the cream of the crop in the uh, in the American Soccer League that season. Yeah. Um, so they have another great season. Um, and once again, facing New York, who has now changed their name from New York Greeks to New York Apollo. Um, and despite all the success they're having, they end up playing, uh, they end up playing that championship game on the road up in New York. Uh, and unfortunately it's met with, uh, with, with a result they didn't want. Um, they played at a place called the Metropolitan Oval. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that at sure. all. Oh, well, that's a, a very legendary, uh, 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 you know, cradle of, uh, of, of ethnic soccer in the New York city area for many, many, many years. Yeah. And, uh, w- what's interesting about it is the Cincinnati Enquirer at the time, the beat writer who covered the comments, uh, Terry Duchinsky, he described it as quote, hardly conducive to a championship soccer match end quote. Um, and apparently it was just, you know, a hill on one side with some boards hastily put down. Um, and the comments were very vocal in the press about losing that match. They lost it one, nothing, um, and they claim that the, the winning goal in overtime was about to be called offside, but the fans rushed the field and fights were breaking out. And uh, Gladstone Afori, who played for the Comets, gives a post-game interview where he's nursing a, nursing a head wound that he claims when he was sucker punched by someone from New York Apollo. So if anyone was following him really closely at the time, like this rivalry with New York was really building, even if they were playing in really small stadiums and to really low kind of raucous crowds. Uh, any idea as to why um, uh, that championship game was played at the uh, home field of the Apollo versus the Comets? I mean, their records were, I know it was a little, little uh, uh, I, I, I look at some of the standings here. I think the Apollo played 14 games, won 10 and lost four uh, during the regular season. Cincinnati uh, played only 12 games. They won 10 and, and lost only two. So a little bit uneven, but uh, I'm just curious as to, Perhaps why, after New York beat Baltimore and Cincinnati defeated Cleveland, uh, why New York got to choose, uh, got to host the game versus Cincinnati, or maybe you don't know. You know, I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I, I couldn't really find anything that like definitively said. Uh, and, you know, I'm not even sure of where the date, the date was when that game was played. The only thing I can think of is maybe there was a conflict with using Nippert Stadium. Um, but... Yeah, you know, I'm not entirely sure as to why all of a sudden it got moved to New York for that year. Well, look, I throw these questions out because our audience tends to somehow find out the answers to these. <laughs> so we, we do put it out there. Absolutely. But um, I think it's I think it's important to note that um, the leading scorer in the league was Eddie Roberts for Cincinnati uh, yeah. that year. And the leading goalkeeper of uh, of the season was, um, uh, is it Antion Cruz is his name? Uh, uh, I believe so. Yes. Yep. Uh, with a goals against average of 0. 0.61, which is just like literally standing on your head, I think. Um, so, so clearly, uh, Ringo Cantillo, I, I'm, I'm assuming made some kind of All Star team. Uh, he didn't show up as MVP or, or uh, uh, obviously Rookie of the Year because he wasn't a rookie that year. Um, but uh, clearly, this team had something going for it on the field, right? I mean, you win the championship the first year. Uh, they, they basically. Uh, they lose uh, in, in overtime for the second year. Um, you know, it seems like the things are, are on the up and up, um, you know, but, um, you know, I, I'm just really curious as to sort of why uh, perhaps the team wasn't uh, either drawing better, especially now at Nipper Field, or, you know, perhaps uh, maybe they were gaining some attention in, in the city or or were they not? Or, or what was sort of the status of, of the team in, in, in Cincinnati, as far as you could tell, around that time, having two championships under their belt? Um, well, so, well, they only had, well, I guess they had their divisional championship, but only one league championship. I'm but sorry, the, yes. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Of course. Oh, no, it's all good. Um, the, I, you know, it's hard to say because what, the, one of the, the few attendance statistics I have found mentions that for a regular season game at Nippert Stadium, they only had 800 people there, which 800 people in that stadium is just 
I, it, it's got to be like watching a, some rec league lacrosse tournament go on between two fraternities. Like it's got to be so quiet and so weird in there. And it's, it's tough because these guys are playing really well. They've got a lot of talent. They're, they're doing a great job on the pitch, but for some reason, I guess it's just not translating to the local population. Um, and they've got a beat writer. They get pretty regular press coverage, but, uh, in all the newspapers I found, I mean, they're, they're pretty much buried in the, uh, in the sports pages. Uh, it's pretty much dominated by the reds, um, and more national headlines. They're usually right there next to the NASL stats from around the country. Um, and even just seeing that kind of makes it feel like, uh, this is a, this is a second rate league. And there is a lot of press throughout kind of their whole ordeal that covers the status of the ASL and whether or not it's really, whether or not it's really a good league. I mean, every year they had franchises in, franchises out, franchises that never finished. Uh, they'd go from three divisions down to two. I mean, for a while, Cincinnati was the southernmost team. So I, I think it's a, this is an important time to sort of bring up sort of where the ASL was was at this point, right? So circa end of the 73 season, um, I, I, one thing we kind of glossed over uh, in 1973, uh, the teams that existed from 72 as well as the new ones uh, donned new nicknames that were uh, decidedly non-ethnic. I think it was an edict from the league and, and, uh, and adopted uh, names that were a bit more uh, I guess more professional sports sounding and or generic, right? So the Comets didn't have that problem, but you, we alluded to it before. The New York Greeks certainly did. Uh, so they became the Apollo. Uh, you had, uh, I guess you had the Schaefer Brewers uh, of uh, of New Jersey became simply the New Jersey Brewers sponsored by Schaefer, uh, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, despite it's still fledgling ness, if that's a word, uh, the league was was on to some level of uh, Americanization and professionalization, I guess, from uh, its uh, its roots as largely an ethnic um, uh, an ethnic uh, center of soccer play. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you can see that effort throughout as they go through. And I, I always found it very interesting. Now you have teams like Real Salt Lake and uh, Kansas City Wizards became Sporting Kansas City. Now there's more of a an attempt to adopt that more European style of naming. I mean, even FC Cincinnati has kind of jumped on that bandwagon, but there was, there was definitely an attempt in the ASL to get that more, like you said, more mainstream sports names. Um, and th there's a couple steps they take later on and in, in later years to try and have a more professional persona and really elevate their status as, as you know, a fledgling amateur league to, they truly wanted to be this professional, professional league on the, on the, on the domestic stage. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seats Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. That's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called the National Forgotten League by Dan Daly. Entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and Audible's got it. By the way, two uh, two guests perhaps that we'll have on the show hopefully sometime soon. But again, Go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30-day trial as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation.
All right. Well, before we get back to the ASL, because you're, we're going to see in a couple of seconds the uh, the how intertwined the story of the Comets and the league itself uh, ultimately became. But um, I think probably the most important thing that happened between seasons 73 and 74 was yet another venue change for their home games and not an upgrade at that. Right. Yeah, correct. Um, what, what's interesting is from from the outside looking in. Uh, they, they moved to Trector Stadium, which is on the, the campus of what was then known as Cincinnati Technical College. Today, it's a Cincinnati State. It's a, it's a very good local institution. Um, but the, the old Cincinnati Technical College had this really old, very basic, uh, one giant thing of stands stadium that hosted both uh, American football <clears throat> as well as baseball. And um, it was a downgrade in terms of facilities. Uh, definitely didn't have the modern quote unquote amenities of Nippert Stadium. But I would think, you know, looking back then, the, the rent was probably way less. Um, location wasn't too dissimilar. They're still centrally located. And it probably gave them a little bit more breathing room. Um, it was a lot smaller. So if you do have another night where only 800 people show up, it's not going to feel as cavernous as Nippert Stadium. But yeah, you're right. This is the third year of their existence. And it's the third venue, the third time they've moved around town. All right, so they get playing in 74, and um, it seems that the the notion of Americans dominating uh, the roster uh, was not any closer to happening than it was in the uh, 72 inaugural season. Uh, but it also seems that, per your writing uh, of this story, the, uh, the issue kind of boiled over into something more uh, urgent and... Uh, and significant uh, as far as the uh, the team's future was concerned. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's very interesting how a lot of times minor league sports owners and promoters will always state these very lofty goals or these huge ambitions. It's you know it's always we're going to put a really competitive product together and we're going to show the world this. And as reality sets in, those messages kind of kind of shift. Um, and where Nick Caporo had started out talking about growing domestic talent and bringing in American players, and it seemed like an initiative from the league, it soon became clear that really wasn't working. And in 1974, um, he recruits a ton of South American players. And there's a few standouts in there. Um, there's a guy named Paul Rockwood, uh, who's from, from Cleveland. Um, and he comes to Cincinnati actually to be a high school teacher at Oak Hills High School. Um, but he had played uh, he had played soccer in college, and he ends up trying out for the Comets, and he ends up getting on the team. But even he makes a a comment to the press that the majority of the team speaks Spanish, and he's got to take Spanish lessons to learn how to communicate with his teammates. So this team and this organization that had set out to grow domestic soccer um, is now a predominantly Spanish speaking team. And there's one one particular incident where. It's documented pretty well in the press. That happens in June 1974. Uh, the Comets are up by a pretty substantial lead. They're up 4 nothing at the half. And uh, the appointed team president, a guy named Andy Lear, goes up to Nick Caporo and suggests, you know, we've, we've got some fans here tonight. Why don't, we, why don't we put in some American players and get some American names out there? And apparently Caporo just lost it, was really upset, didn't like anyone telling him what to do, and he, uh, he kept his South American players in. And they ended up winning, uh, but the, the president, Andy Lear, goes to the press and talks about changes are coming. Um, unfortunately for him, Nick Caporo is not only the coach, but he's still the majority owner um, and really is the one who really has control of the team. Um, and the next day, they have this big meeting. Uh, a lot of the American players go to the press and say they're kind of disappointed with their playing time, but they really enjoy playing and they're hoping to stick around. Uh, the meeting lasts allegedly four hours. And Andy Lear, the president who really advocated for American players, ends up stepping down. And Nick Capurro remains staunch. Um, he's going to use the players he wants. And if they try to bring in a new coach, all those South American players he has will, will quote unquote, refuse to play for anyone else, including Ringo Cantillo, who is still living with him at the time. So it, it got got to be kind of a contentious issue among Nick Capurro and and some of the people around him. Well, uh, it's also, uh, I guess, a, 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 a bit of a, a, a window into the ownership, right? Because Capurro had, I think, kind of ceded ownership of the team a season or two prior and now, I guess, was sort of back in the fold, not only as coach, but also as, I guess, part owner or at least influencer in the, in the uh, front office. 
Yeah, um, it, it gets. It, I'm sorry, I, the, you're totally right there. I, I misspoke. He he did step down as majority owner, but he was still very much financially invested in the team. But he had brought on new investors. Um, but every year there's kind of a revolving door of these four investors would step out, these four would come in, and then so and so would leave, and so and so would come in. Um, but he definitely held the influence. He's the one who got the players to come to Cincinnati. Um, he's the one who was coaching them day in, day out. So he exerted a lot of control. And there's a lot of accounts, not just of his soccer career, but some of his other pursuits, that he really wasn't the easiest person to work with. Um, there's a lot of interesting takes on him throughout throughout Cincinnati history. Um, but apparently, you know, he had the loyalty of his players. And if he wasn't going to get his way, they weren't going to play. Well, as the uh, county coroner, I guess it's somebody you probably don't want to cross either uh, for maybe a different reason. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I, it, se- it seems to me like that blow up is, uh, is, is co- almost a microcosm, I guess, of, uh, I guess, the soul. And it's an argument that's kind of still going on today. The soul of, of quote unquote, American soccer, right, where, where the idea is, you know, how do you make the American player uh, that much better by giving uh, the players uh, born and raised in this country the chance to play at a high level and obviously hopefully, uh, you know, have some effect uh, on the world stage in international competitions like the World Cup and such. I mean, it seems to me, you know, you had teams in the uh, NASL like Philadelphia in 1974, the Philadelphia Adams, which uh, which I think won it all in 74 by, you know, with a predominantly American team. Uh, the Dallas Tornado as well were, were stocked. Uh, full uh, with uh, American players, Kyle Rourke Jr., for example. I mean, you, you had uh, some burgeoning uh, ideas around American Americanizing the game, so to speak. So you, you can clearly see that uh, uh, there are plenty of people who had differing opinions as to sort of what quality soccer product was going to look like here in the States. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there was a player named Bob Nelson for the Comets who spoke to the press when this whole issue came to light and kind of blew up. And he specifically references uh, the efforts of Philadelphia and Dallas in the NASL. And while it's not clearly stated, I, I think one of the challenges the ASL faced with their whole, you know, uh, sorry to borrow the quote, but quote unquote America first movement was you, you, you do have two rival leagues going um, and there's quite a few teams to play for. And there's not a whole lot of American talent to go around. Um, and you do have franchises like Philadelphia and Dallas who are truly making the effort and putting the funds forth to grab domestic talent. Um, and there's no, there's not a whole lot of there's not a whole lot of good salaries in the ASL. It, it later comes out that uh, you know they were offering people one thousand dollars a year to play, which you know even back in the seventies was not particularly great for a for a minor league athlete or a professional athlete. Um, so it's, you know, there's all these teams cropping up, kind of diluting the talent pool and there's not a whole lot of talent to pull from, pull from, from the beginning. So I think they were a little bit too, uh, they overstated their goals a little bit and I don't think they really understood the true landscape of what was going on in terms of American talent. Well, okay. So in the midst of this blow up, uh, enters a, uh, a seminal person in this story, um, a, D- a DJ, a radio personality in town. You want to kind of describe Jim Scott and his role in all of this? Yeah. So if you if you say the name Jim Scott to most Cincinnatians or anybody who can hear 700 WLW across the country, uh, they're not going to recognize that name as a as an American soccer franchise uh, president or someone involved with the history of American soccer. They will recognize him as this iconic voice who was on the radio every morning. Um, and back then in the 70s, before he gets involved with the Comets, He's just the, the local rock DJ on a small radio station called WSAI. Um, he's also a father. He's got young kids that are playing soccer. And his employer also happens to uh, host the Cincinnati Comets on the radio. So he's, he's aware of the Comets, and he's actually he's a fan. Um, and his kids go to like the different youth nights and the different clinics held in the offseason. Um, but he's really just kind of getting his career going. Um, and he's made a little bit of a name for himself. Uh, he's got a fair amount of money. Um, he's starting to, to rise in popularity, not as not yet as big as he would he, as he would be. And um, he wants to see the Comets succeed, uh, succeed. So he kind of comes up with this idea of, you know, put me in touch with Nick Caporo, put me in touch with the organization and let me figure out how I can help promote them, how I can help get their get their name out there. Um, and he goes to a lunch with that intention and he comes away as a, as a part owner. 
not only a part owner, though, uh, it seems like he became uh, almost uh, uh, an integral part of uh, the ASL uh, overall, too. Yeah, um, his he just kind of like he doesn't just dive in and take a big bite. I mean, he he gets pulled in uh, immediately. Um, he becomes president of not just the Comets, um, but eventually the league as well. Um, and what he, he comes to find out, and he was, he was kind enough to speak with me. Uh, we got put in contact through a mutual friend. Um, and really, we spent a couple hours talking about his time with them. Um, not only is he invested in the team, but he's really the only one who's particularly passionate about it. So he takes, a, he takes Spanish lessons to learn how to commu- communicate with the different players. Um, he's there at the practices. He's helping it out on the marketing front. He's helping out acquiring people, helping arrange flights, things like that. And at all the owners meetings that the league is holding, he's the only one going. And uh, his leadership kind of starts to shine through. His creativity shines through. And the league realizes we need someone to, to kind of guide us. So this guy who just wanted to help promote him on the radio gets named president of the entire league. And uh, according to your story, it, uh, it it appears that he was um, instrumental in luring a uh, basketball legend by the name of Bob Cousy to become the commissioner of the ASL, a, uh, clearly a coup public relations wise uh, it, that year. Yeah. Uh, one of the ideas that uh, both Jim Scott and the, the other owners came up with was they, they realized that the ASL kind of it, it needed a face. Um, and it needed someone who could give them a little bit more legitimacy. Um, so they decided, okay, we're going to go out. We're going to get you know, someone related to professional sports who's a household name. Um, and actually, the first person they tried to get was uh, broadcaster Howard Cassell. And, uh, and he turned them down. Um, but Jim Scott came up with the idea of let's contact Bob Cousy. And Jim had grown up on the East Coast and uh, where Cousy was known as the Houdini of the hardwood, this incredible NBA player, um, really well-liked, really great career. And as Jim Scott referred to him, he said to me, you know, growing up as a kid where I come from, Bob Cousy was God. Everybody knew him. Um, interestingly enough, though, Bob Cousy was not well-liked in Cincinnati. Uh, he had been brought in to coach the NBA Cincinnati Royals. Um, he briefly came out of retirement to play as a player. Um, he traded Oscar Robertson, which was incredibly unpopular. The team went on a downward trend, and he helped negotiate the move uh, to Kansas City. So he was not really well liked by the local media here, but even Jim Scott realized this is a name who can kind of get us in the headlines and really show that we're we're committed to to rising up and really elevating this league to something more professional. Yeah, but to his own admission, Kuzi, right? He knew virtually nothing about the game of soccer. Oh yeah, I mean he comes right out right out of the the initial press conference and says it and I you know I think there was a whole like kerfuffle where they scheduled a press conference and he didn't even show up for the first time and you know he comes right out and says, "Well, you know I'm I'm learning about it just as quickly as you are." So there's a, there's a lot to get done. But yeah, you know this guy was a great basketball player. Doesn't necessarily translate into knowing a whole lot about soccer. Um so I I think they were hoping he could give them some guidance in the professional sports world, but really on the uh on the, the front of the game itself. I mean, <laughs> Kuzi wasn't really offered much. Well, I'm just trying to get my head around the idea that Howard Cosell was the first choice. Uh, wonder, I wonder, <laughs> I, I'd like to know what the story of that was. Maybe, uh, I don't know if Jim Scott ever revealed that or if he was part of that process too. You, you know, we, we talked for a long time and, and, and Jim, Jim is an awesome guy. He's, he's now retired from being this iconic radio host. Uh, and there were so many more questions I had later on that I just – I haven't gotten around to, to following up with or, or pursuing those avenues yet. But uh, I, I'm curious as to what that decision was, and I'm curious as to what uh, Howard Cassell's reaction was when he, when he got asked. I, my, my imagination is his reaction was, you know, what the hell's the ASL? Well, it's interesting. I do know that Cosell uh, would uh, be quite the champion uh, later in the decade, I think, certainly when seeing the Cosmos in his backyard in New York and you know, he he went on a number of uh, uh, his radio shows and television and, and whatnot to uh, essentially proclaim soccer to be the the next great sports uh, phenomenon here in the United States. And, you know, he was right. I mean, you know, eventually. Um, but uh, I'm sure he was flattered at first and then, you know, probably uh, dismissed it in his own um, unique and inimitable style 
uh, <laughs> Absolutely. in that process. Well, 74, though, on the field, not so bad a season, right? Um, uh, Cincinnati, uh, again, uh, met its uh, nemesis in the, in the now New York Apollo in the um, – uh, the lead up to the championship game, they didn't get to the championship, but uh, they uh, did make it to the semifinals. And and Ringo Cantillo again, after a uh, a year of I guess slacking the year before, uh, became the MVP once more. Uh, and clearly, uh, something still very strong and and good despite all that uh, consternation uh, going on on the field with uh, with the Cincinnati franchise. Yeah, um, and y- what's interesting is Nick Caporo kind of treated Cantillo as like as like his ace in the hole, it was a threat. And he was so talented. Capurro always claimed that there were international clubs that were interested in him. And all, he would also claim all the time that there were NASL clubs who were interested in him. Um, and apparently this guy was a hot commodity. But like you said, he, he plays really well. Um, they do face the Apollo again in the lead up to the championship. And what's interesting about that is by this year, they're in the same division as New York because the ASL has lost so many teams that they've gone from three divisions down to just west and east. And it's really essentially just a handful of teams in the Midwest and a few on the East Coast, nothing in the South, no, nothing out West. So the, the league has faltered a little bit, um, but now they don't even get the chance for revenge in the championship. They lose in the playoffs. But still, by by all accounts, I mean, that, that, that's a pretty good season on the pitch. Well, as we turn into 1975, a, a crucial and, and determining year for for a lot of different reasons. Certainly, number one, you know, in June, you had the arrival of uh, arguably the world's greatest player, both then and uh, ever in Pele uh, with the New York Cosmos. Uh, you had uh, CBS uh, broadcasting uh, uh, not only that game, but the uh, the championship game that season. Uh, and it's clear that the NASL was uh, quite ascendant as it, uh, I think, was rounding rounding up to about 18 teams or so by then. Um, and uh, I, I got to think that that was uh, making the folks in Cincinnati – uh, sit up and, and and Jim Scott in particular sit up and pay more attention to either what was going to happen with this ASL in the shadow of it, i.e., can it survive and live on as a uh, as a parallel or um, a colleague, I guess, of the NASL, or perhaps Cincinnati might, uh, as a relatively strong franchise or at least established, uh, might want to entertain the idea of maybe jumping to the bigger show that was the NASL themselves. Yeah, um, th- things get dramatically different for American soccer around this time. And as you very well know, as a Cosmos fan, uh, the arrival of Pelé just changes everything. Um, and while it elevates the NASL, the ASL is still, even with Jim Scott at the helm running the league, is still very much an afterthought. And the leagues have grown pretty far apart in terms of both fans, revenue, um, media coverage, and attendance. Um and Jim Scott's got, you know, he, he's got a lot of fires to manage. Not only is this guy a family man and still working a normal job, he's got to run an entire professional soccer league with no professional sports management background, and he's got to run his club here at home. Uh, and things get really strange. They, they start heavily marketing the, the aspect of using American players again, um, and they really try to drive this home to everybody. But it's not so much because they, they want to turn to, like, we're really here to grow the game. It's more from costs. You could pay American domestic players a lot less than you could than you could you know spending money on recruiting international talent. And kind of towards the end of the season, Jim Scott entertains a couple different ideas, and one of them is, I'm either going to sell the team outright and get out of this. Uh, I'm going to bring in new local investors who really were not materializing. They had kind of had a revolving door of people throughout the years. I'm going to open it up to public ownership and let let fans buy shares of the club, um, or I'm going to try and pursue joining the North American Soccer League. And even Nick Caporo at this time has become so frustrated with the ASL's uh, referees and officiating and the facilities of other teams. Even he's talking about joining the North American Soccer League. But uh, both he and Jim Scott kind of give a quote towards the end of that season saying, now that Pelé is in the NASL, the, the cost of franchises and the stock of the NASL has just risen so high, it may be really hard to do. Well, I think the ASL uh, even themselves wanted to uh, pursue a star or two of their of their own. I know uh, there was a concerted effort to uh, lure the uh, Portuguese star, Eusebio, uh, into the league. Uh, I think in the uh, Rhode Island, uh, the Rhode Island franchise, as the NASL was kind of circling around Hartford and Boston, 
Uh, and I guess uh, even to the point of uh, trying to convince the various ASL owners to pass the hat, so to speak, to for the good <laughs> of the league to get a CBO in there. Uh, and I guess for whatever reason, it didn't happen. And of course, the CBO uh, then went to Boston in the NASL and, uh, uh, you know, flitted around a couple of different franchises in the uh, NASL. Actually, I came back to the ASL a little later, but uh, it, it seems like they were trying to at least try to figure out some way to kind of play the the star card themselves, the ASL. Yeah, they were, they were definitely, they were, they were definitely making good, good efforts. And they were looking at westward expansion and trying to have a more national footprint, maybe in hopes of luring a TV contract there one day. Uh, Bob Cousy spoke to that a little bit. And I think that's where they were really hoping he would come in. Um, so, you know, in their own way, they were, they were trying, uh, but they also had to cut costs and really, really kind of bring it more back down to reality. Um, they were still losing teams here and there. Um, and there was a lot going on and the Comets themselves, uh, really, really struggled. They had a lot of players where they, they mentioned in the press, they were getting fined for lack of effort, uh, which is pretty unheard of these days. Uh, I mean, these guys just, they believed they weren't going out there to play, that they were just kind of showing up to get a paycheck. Um, and it really kind of became a mess, um, for one of the more established, as the league is trying to get better, one of the more established clubs in Cincinnati is really just kind of falling apart. Well, it seems like the, even uh, their star player, Ringo Cantillo, although he apparently had a uh, <clears throat> still had a star season, an all-star season, um, it's pretty clear that uh, he was probably a commodity between, uh, you know, for some other franchises. There's a Mexican team that was interested. The, uh, the Cosmos apparently were interested, uh, which would have been an interesting move for him. Uh, and he was even uh, loaned uh, to the Tampa Bay Rowdies the, prior to the season as a, uh, for, for their indoor tournament. Uh, and ultimately, yeah. that's where he wound up going after after the Comet season ended. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of quotes from Nick Caporo over the year who is still up until Ringo Cantillo turns 18. He's his legal guardian in the United States. And Nick Caporo would constantly uh, talk about this bidding war for Ringo's talents. And he would always threaten that. Any day now, he can move to a better club. And that particular year, like you said, he's mentioning Tampa Bay is interested. The Cosmos are interested. Uh, club America and Mexico is interested. But it, all the time it would come up, he'd mention all these different European squads or other domestic teams who were interested. And Ringo never seemed to move. And it was highly speculated at the beginning of the season he was finally going to leave the Comets. Um, but lo and behold, he, he spends 1975 in Cincinnati. And he has a great season. But he's also, by this point, he, he's an adult. He's married uh, to a woman he met in high school here. Um, and he, he's, pretty more, he's much more vocal in the press. He went from being this kind of quiet star to the face of the organization. And he, he's got a very interesting quote where he says, if I was investing money in this team, I would have quit a long time ago. No matter what they do, soccer is not going to go over in Cincinnati. Yeah, that's... Uh not great to hear from your star player in the middle of uh, in the middle of a season when you're trying to make the playoffs and uh, and, <laughs> and you're, still, you're still not drawing fans right so so it's a very uh, very interesting thing to say to the press uh you know that's an interesting that's a very interesting quote and I, again it's you call that out it's a it's a, a cutout from the uh, from from your article um in some respects you almost wonder if you could put that on the side of a of, uh, of the stands at Nippert Stadium, um, because uh, it, it truly kind of puts the the success of the current team in the, into context, now, doesn't it? Well, it absolutely does. And you're know, reading it when I was doing the research for this, and I came across that. I mean, I, I'm sitting in my office alone, laughing out loud at that because it seems so ironic now. But when you think about it in context at the time, you can't really blame the, this kid for being for being frustrated. Uh, I mean, no matter how well they played, they're in this kind of this league that had its ups and downs. And despite all their success over the years, I mean, they won a championship in their first year. You know, nobody's coming out. And th this guy could be playing allegedly you know, he's in a bidding war. He could be playing for so many other places. And no matter how well he plays, he's only playing in, in front of a couple hundred people here in Cincinnati. All right. Well, let's uh, let's uh, maybe uh, get to sort of the, uh, the the final sort of coda here of this story. Um, you're you're getting out of the uh, '75 season, and um, uh, it's clear that Jim Scott is trying to make something happen here. You were mentioning some of his options, uh, but you also quote him as saying that uh, there was basically an attempt 
uh, to get the Comets, the market of Cincinnati at least, uh, into the NASL. Uh, and obviously, I'm sure that uh, Jim Scott was uh, an integral part of uh, those conversations at the least. Yeah, um, he was he was very much invested in it. And, um, and I think it was for, for two main reasons. Uh, you know, on, on one hand, Jim Scott really believed in soccer. He believed in this team. Um, and he wanted to see see it move on, but he also didn't really have the personal funds to keep pouring money into it and to keep it going. Um, and and you know, on the other hand, he doesn't he doesn't want to see it fail. Um, and he mentions in 1975 in an interview that the NASL is quote heavily interested end quote um, in getting in getting the Cincinnati market, which at the time is you know a fairly big market, and there's there's not a whole lot of competition around aside from the ASL. Um, and he gets put into contact with maybe the, the best person to make it happen. Um, uh, Lamar Hunt, who I, you know, listening to your podcast before, I know you're very well, well aware of Lamar Hunt's efforts in American soccer and other things. Yeah. Iconic. Right. Uh, and, uh, arguably the uh, sort of informal, uh, 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 hand of God, I guess, with the NASL for, for many, many years. Um, what, what transpired there? Was he pretty much the emissary trying to sort of suss out whether Cincinnati had the, the right stuff to be part of the NISL? Oh, a- absolutely. I mean, the, the way it was kind of, uh, pa- the way the picture was painted to me is that, you know, Lamar Hunt, the, you know, obviously a billionaire from his efforts and his family's efforts in the oil industry, you know, the successful merger of the AFL and the NFL, um, and a guy who truly cared about the NASL and seeing soccer come up was really the one who, he held a lot of clout in the NASL. Um, and as Jim Scott was kind of putting feelers out there to see if anyone might be interested, he gets put in touch with Lamar Hunt, who's, who's also very busy. So Scott drives to Indianapolis, to the airport, and meets Lamar Hunt, who has flown in, um, gone to church at the airport that morning, and then meets him for lunch and kind of sizes him up. And the way Jim talks about it is awesome, because at the time, Jim is you know, he's essentially a nobody, um, even in the pro sports world. And he's not this big disc jockey yet. And here he is having lunch with, with a billionaire, um, and a guy who's done so many amazing things in American sports. And apparently Lamar Hunt really liked him. And, uh, by the end of the lunch, he passes on Jim's name and some contact information about some investors in Michigan who are really, really interested in putting an NASL team in Cincinnati. And uh, it's Jim's understanding from his recollection and from from everything I can find out that they were probably going to keep the Comets brand and essentially just, quote unquote, move the team into the NASL um, if they could work everything out. But alas, it didn't happen. Uh, and in your article, it almost seems like perhaps one of the reasons why, maybe because the not only the uh, investors maybe didn't fully materialize, but perhaps was Scott's insistence of. Uh, keeping Nick Capurro as coach. Well, so what's interesting is, yeah, I asked him about that, and um, and, and Jim Scott. I mean, if you've ever listened to him on the radio, his nickname was Good Old Jim Scott. He he's known for being exactly how he sounds on the radio. He truly is a good guy. Uh, he's very loyal, um, very honorable, a uh, very honorable gentleman. Um, and there's a couple quotes where he gives to the newspaper, and he, he speaks pretty frankly that. He thinks he could have found at least other investors to help keep the ASL version going um, if Nick Capurro wasn't a part of it. Uh, Nick Capurro was very divisive. A lot of players spoke badly about him after they left. Um, there's one player who mentions that you know, he thinks people just come to the games just to yell at Nick Capurro and set him off. Uh, apparently, the guy had a little bit of a temper, was very, very passionate about the, the sport he loved. Um, so Jim seemed to believe that they're, they probably could have rounded up several more local investors or at least other interested parties if Nick Caporo wasn't involved with the team. But Jim was also very loyal to him. Um, and Jim knew, recognized that Nick Caporo had started this club and it was his, kind of his baby and kind of his dream. And he really wanted to make sure that Nick remained a part of it and got to see it through. Um, when the potential NASL investors came in, um, you know, I think that fell through for, for several different reasons, uh, mainly the economy at the time, which Jim spoke a little bit about. And with those investors being scared away, I guess, by the various economic bumps in the road, there really was no other option, I guess. I guess the ASL, which Jim Scott was the president of at the time, you know, there didn't seem to be any, didn't seem to be very much support, at least in Cincinnati circles, for 
going another round in the ASL, especially with folks like Ringo Cantillo not even in the mix anymore. Yeah, um, like, like you mentioned earlier, by this time, at, at the end of the 75 season, going into 76, uh, Ringo Cantillo has moved on. Um, the Michigan investors have backed out, citing the economy, which is uh, is beginning to recover, but like there's not a whole lot of confidence in it. Um, and Jim Scott uh, speaks pretty frankly to the press at the time, and he says, you know, essentially the way with the way things are going, they could have been able to, they would have been able to buy an NASL franchise a few years ago. Um, but now you've got Pelé involved. You've got all these international stars coming in. Like you mentioned, CBS is involved with a national TV contract. Um, and the price of an NASL franchise has just skyrocketed. So th- they're not able to do it themselves. Uh, the only investors they've been able to find, you know, handpicked by Lamar Hunt himself, um, they've pulled out. Um, and was, what was once pretty much this, this incredible franchise and, you know, really kind of the, the cornerstone of the league for a little bit, um, now is not going to be able to play. And, uh, they kind of cut their losses and they die a really, really quiet death. It's very, it's a very interesting story about not, you know, the ASL, which I think a lot of people sort of have, you know, forgotten about or, or you know, not really conscious of uh, perhaps say the NASL, but the fact that Cincinnati came that close to having its own NASL franchise and perhaps rewriting the whole uh, story of soccer and Cincinnati uh, in the process. In some respects, you you know, uh, it's interesting. The team, the team, you know, didn't draw all that well in the ASL, yet you had investors interested in the market despite all of that. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And what, what I always kind of maybe fantasized about or thought would have been really cool is, you know, much like the stories on your podcast, I, I'm fascinated by these teams that have gone by the wayside and these leagues that came and went. And, you know, a lot of these NASL teams were really trying to make a go of it in some of the more professional, big coliseums and stadiums. And, you know, maybe if they make it to the NASL, may, you know, maybe they go down with the rest of the league later in the mid 80s. Um, but maybe they get they, they have a little bit more money. They got a little bit more clout. There's some more legitimacy to their name. And, you know, maybe Cincinnati is hosting a huge match between the Comets and the Cosmos and Pelé is playing in front of this massive crowd at Riverfront Stadium here in Cincinnati. You know, maybe it turns out like that. Maybe in the end, no one would have cared anyways. Um, but I mean, as Jim Scott says at the end of the article, you know, they were this close to making it happen. Um, and it really is a shame we never get to see that aspect of the story uh, kind of play out. Well, but it, it seems that uh, time, uh, I don't know, heals all wounds or perhaps sort of sets some lessons in motion because here you have a phenomenally successful FC Cincinnati franchise in, in only its second full season of, of existence, uh, just doing gangbusters uh, in, in the city, uh, record crowd after record crowd, a very close run in the U.S. Open Cup this year, and uh, perhaps knocking on the door of the big prize of all, a Major League Soccer franchise. Um, you wonder, and I, I suspect this article, and, and I, I do encourage everybody uh, to to go online, we'll post it on the website, and you'll be able to click through from our from our uh, from our episode here at, to either at uh, Queen City Disco or QueenCityDiscovery dot com. Uh, the extraordinary story of the Cincinnati Comets. I wonder, uh, perhaps, Ronnie, if um, you know if there is uh, any thought to um, bringing back uh, a few of the folks from the old Comets story and maybe tying it in somehow. I don't know, perhaps a patch one game or bringing Jim Scott or Ringo Cantillo or, uh, you know, some of the family members of the Capurro family, you know, back to, you know, perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a nod, I guess, to the uh, the beginning, early, scruffy days of, of professional outdoor soccer in Cincinnati uh, prior to the FC Cincinnati franchise. Uh, you know, I think that'd be, I, I think that'd be awesome. Actually, I was listening to one of your episodes recently about the, um, the, the kind of hybrid Pittsburgh and Philadelphia NFL team during World War II and how that they were honored uh, not too long ago at a game for kind of this little relatively unknown story. Um, they, they gave these guys some recognition. Um, and one of the things I really like about FC Cincinnati is they, they started off a little shaky, but their, their connection to the community has been really, really good. And as someone who is active in a supporters group and the leadership of one, we, we've got a very good relationship with the front office and, and how we help put things together and 
kind of mutually beneficial. Um, and I, I would hope they'd be open to that, maybe honoring some of these people or at least highlighting that story because, you know, maybe they weren't that successful at the gate, but they were definitely an integral part to the history of Cincinnati. And occasionally I'll meet older individuals who remember like, oh yeah, you know, when I was a kid, I, I used to catch the bus to go see the occasional comics game or when I was playing soccer as a kid in the seventies, we would go to their clinics up in Fairfield or some of the other suburbs. Um, and I, I think that would just be a really nice historical nod to, you know, maybe like you said, you wear that Comets patch one night or you, you raise their flag up at Nippert, but it, it's just incredible to sit there. I, all the games I've been to this year when we played Chicago in the open cup to a sold out crowd and there's, you know, 35,000 people in the stadium. It, it was fun to stand there and think like, you know, 40 years ago, there was only 800 people here and, and no one seemed to care. And, you know, look how far we've come now. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. And I think um, <clears throat> I think there are a lot of uh, soccer fans and and snobs and, and others in between, I guess, who, you know, uh, you wonder. I mean, the Major League Soccer, right, in all its success in the 20 plus years it's been around. I mean, it's, it's an amazing feat, right? Soccer specific stadiums and 24 plus franchises and on and on and on. Um, you know, there is some embrace, right, of of history. But then in some cases, there is there is not, uh, depending on the franchise, depending on on sort of your perspective and stuff. And and I think, you know, in some of these uh, other episodes that we've done, not just in the sport of soccer, but in, in basketball, we had uh, we have this week's episode with Molly Kazmer, who was a, a pioneer in the old WBL women's professional basketball league in the late seventies. And, you know, the, these are, you know, the, that was a league and, and, and times and players and, and coaches, you know, upon which, you know, the, the success of the WNBA today in the women's game would not be uh, would not be possible without those early pioneering efforts. And in some respects, I think the story of the Comets uh, is is some of that foundational uh, glue, I guess, for what uh, today exists as the phenomenon that is FC Cincinnati, both now and potentially on the grander stage in the in the years to come. So for you, somebody who's gone back into the history of this team, the Comets, and uh, is enjoying the fruits of the current team, uh, I wish you uh, nothing but uh, Happiness and success both uh, both now and hopefully in the years to come, perhaps as an MLS franchise down the road. It seems like you have a good shot. Yeah, I mean, by all accounts, things are looking really good to get to Major League Soccer. And I mean, I mean that, that's very exciting. I, I think a lot of us are hoping for that. Um, but I can tell you right now, it seems to be most people are invested in this club, the current club, um, because of its connection with the city. Um, and how their story kind of aligns with this resurgence we've seen of civic pride and where the city's heading into kind of more of a progressive and uplifting. People are taking pride in Cincinnati once again. Um, and I, I can't speak for everybody in my group. I can't speak for every fan. But while we'd definitely love to see Major League Soccer hopefully become a reality here, um, I can tell you there's at least there's a good chunk of us who whether they end up in a, a third version of the NASL, the current version or stick it out in the USL. You know, we're here to support this club for the long haul and maybe give them a little bit more support than the uh, the, the poor Comets ever saw. All right. Before we let you go, let's uh, let you get a couple of plugs in both for your website. To your, uh, <laughs> this is not your day job. You might want to give us uh, a hint uh, to our audience about what you do and perhaps where you can find out more about what you do. Yeah. So I actually, uh, as a day job, I, I've got a background as a photographer and a writer. Um, I actually work for our transit authority here in Cincinnati, uh, doing a lot of phot photography, graphics, social media work for them. But um, I've had this website, queencitydiscovery.com, for 10 years. Um, uh, I love the city I live in. I love where I'm from. And I've always kind of been fascinated by our forgotten history, whether it's been our abandoned subway or uh, some of the old factories and stuff that I've photographed over the years. And uh, the comets just kind of fell into that love of this forgotten history and showing what uh, Cincinnati can all be about. So yeah, queencitydiscovery.com or queencitydisco.com. Either one works. Um, there's there's lots of uh, what I think is interesting. I don't know if most people find it interesting, but I, I think there's some good stuff on there if anybody wants to check it out. There's also a very good book there too, uh, which I, uh, I highly recommend. Um, uh, it's called Fading Ads of Cincinnati that came out a couple of years ago. Um, and it, it, I think it's almost like a little mini subgenre of photography out there. I I've seen a bit of this in, in other cities and other locales, the sort of, I guess, the, uh, you know, the side, uh, uh, you know, a building type of ads, you know, sort of the large presences that have either faded away or have been abandoned or forgotten. And, and, and obviously the stories 
uh, that they hinted at from uh, from years gone by. Yeah, um, that was so. Fading Edge of Cincinnati was the second book uh, I ever wrote, and um, it was uh, a publisher reached out to me. It was something I'd always been interested in, and uh, I got to spend a whole summer walking around, looking at old hand painted ads on the side of buildings, and looking into their story and. Um, those kind of overlapped with an old sports team too. Uh, down at our, our riverfront arena, there's an old, uh, there's an old faded, old fading, uh, painted ad that says, uh, beehive on it with an arrow pointing to the elevator. Um, uh, what that was referenced to was when we had the Cincinnati stingers of the world hockey association, uh, the club level that you had to take the elevator to get to was called the beehive. Um, so kind of got to have a lot of different passions overlap there and, putting that book together and getting to look in like into little histories like that was, it was awesome. It was very rewarding. Well, Ronnie, uh, keep in mind, right. You know that, uh, what this uh, podcast is all about. So, uh, you need to <laughs> obviously start to get going on uh, photographic and written histories, uh, of the Cincinnati Royals in the, uh, the old NBA, uh, the Cincinnati kids, which we barely didn't even talk about the MISL, uh, the stingers of the WHA. Um, I look forward to more stories about other Cincinnati teams of your, uh, in, uh, in the months and years to come, let's hope. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there, there's a lot on my plate and a lot of things on the to-do list and looking into some of those teams is definitely something I want to do. And in the meantime, I got a lot of good inspiration. I, I truly enjoy your podcast and, uh, I, I caught the like two pretty recent episodes and like just, just down a rabbit hole. So I've been working my way back from the beginning all the way up. And I think I'm on uh, tonight when I go for a run, it's going to be episode 15, Um, So I'm looking forward to it and getting uh, getting to kind of digest all of those. Thank you. You're very kind. I hope I don't put you to sleep on mile number seven. (laughs) Well, if I could get to mile number seven, we'd find out. But (laughs) I know I really do like it. You do a great job. Okay, there it is. There's our chat with uh, Ronnie Salerno live and uh, in person from beautiful downtown Cincinnati, Ohio. I didn't hear any... uh, any rushing trains in the in the background so uh luckily we're able to hear him loud and clear uh ronnie salerno.com uh, is the place where you can check out uh ronnie's photography and video and, and other creative exploits including uh some uh, snippets uh from uh, his book that we mentioned fading ads of cincinnati that came out in 2015 that's ronnie salerno.com s-a-l-e-r-n-o and ronnie is spelled r-o-n-n-y Uh, com, And you'll find that uh, on our website uh, as well, in case you couldn't get that. Uh, Also, uh, the editorial versions of Ronnie's Creative Genius uh, can be found at either queencitydisco.com or queencitydiscovery.com. Either place will get you uh, a lot of uh, very interesting writings and uh, uh, and creativity, including the uh, the original article from which this episode uh, emanated from, The Extraordinary Story of the Cincinnati Comets. Uh, the story that uh, Ronnie wrote and uh, uh, the rabbit hole that I went down to uh, become interested uh, in this story. Again, Ronnie, thank you for being with us. Thank you for uh, listening and being a friend of the show. We uh, look forward to, uh, we assume, uh, at least another forgotten Cincinnati sports story to come from you uh, in the months ahead. Uh, No pressure there. Uh, Thanks again to everybody for listening. Thank you for all for your uh, tweets and your your commentary. And a particular thank you again to our friends at Podfly Productions. Uh, That's uh, Jerry Payne, Eric Begay, Corey Coates, David Gregerson. Thank you so much. Podfly.net for all your podcast production needs. Check them out. We love them. And uh, you will too, if you decide to give them a try. Thank you, Podfly, for making us sound as good as we do. And uh, take care to everybody. Uh, Thank you for all listening, uh, for all of you for listening as he stumbles his way through his uh, exit here. And uh, we'll see you next week here on our fine broadcast. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.